Welcome back to some new r slash malicious compliance stories, where people comply to the letter, but not the spirit of a request. I hope you had a great day. The first story is called Approval for Everything. I'm in IT, and where I work, my team is awesome. We are usually allowed to our own devices about everything related to the network and equipment related to keeping everything running. Our manager usually just wanted reasons for everything, and if it made sense, it was cleared the same day. This was till around the beginning of the year. Our higher managers decided they are going to keep a tighter leash on spending and such, so they looked to the IT department, because we do at times need over 6k of hardware for replacements, normal wear and tear over the year. And we recently did a 75k network rebuild because of corporate decisions, but we've kept to the assigned budget. In order to keep IT under their thumb, they've switched to requiring submitting approvals before submitting the official purchase order. The notice said essentially, if IT needs to order it, we want to approve it first. So everything gets an approval form. IT needs $75 for more post-its, approval form. Critical stuff for an immediate response? Approval form. Basically, it's gotten to the point where something that took us 1-2 to two weeks for delivery now takes 4-5 to five weeks for the same thing, which has caused strains on everything we usually work on. Parts that need to be replaced are still on order, so stations and computers are offline until replacements are approved. It's satisfying watching the management scramble to mass approve things once it's brought up as impacting the site's work. The next story is called Paid Time Off. When I worked corrections, I requested for two weeks off. I had been there for years and accrued plenty of paid leave. It was given to me as I had done some months in advance for a personal event. The two weeks went by way too quick. I had specifically lined up my two week break to lead into my two days off, at the beginning of the break and at the end, so I could maximize my time off. However, during my normal off days, a family emergency came up that was quite serious, so I asked for another two days off to handle my situation. I was told by my direct supervisor that there was no way she was approving that because we are only allowed to use 84 hours of leave in one continuous block. Given our rotating written schedules and 12 hour shifts, this equaled 2 weeks, and she ordered me to come in the next day, or I would receive a write up. I didn't argue, because I knew she was correct, so I showed up that night and reported for my shift. Much to my surprise, my captain had called out sick, so a relief captain came in to fill her shift. I asked him to give me the next day off after my shift was over. He and I had a rapport given the number of years we've worked with each other previously, and so he looked at the schedule and my leave. You know you've got plenty of leave, right? Yes, I know. I just need some of it to handle my business tomorrow. No, I mean you've got plenty of leave to take. And the roster is filled the next two weeks. Yeah, I just got off a two week vacation. I stopped because he winked at me, and it finally clicked. We can only take up to two weeks off consecutively. Nothing says we can take off two weeks, come in for, say an hour, then go home and take off another two weeks. So I did, and he signed the paperwork, stating, it's not my shift, screw that. I handled my emergency literally the next day. It turned out to not be as serious as we thought. And then I enjoyed another paid two weeks off from work. It was great. To add to the bliss, I reported back from work to find out that my normal captain was fired and replaced for some kind of negligence or something. It was a great month. The captain everyone liked, who gave me the PTO, stayed for a couple more years before retiring. The last story is called Bait and Switch. The city I live in has extremely inflated vehicle values compared to the surrounding areas. If you buy the same car from a neighboring state, you can often save 3-4k without really trying. 
When I buy a new vehicle, which happens every 3 to 4 years, I always look in the surrounding states to compare pricing. This story happened about 5 years ago and the malicious compliance is still ongoing to this day. I was shopping for a new car, brand new, and found one that matched my specs. About 12 hours away in a neighboring state. It was priced about $5000 below competitors. After looking up flights, there was a one-way direct flight that took me to their local airport for around $175. Plus the gas to drive back, I was looking at a total of maybe $275 to save $5000. Absolutely worth it in this situation. I reached out to the dealership, negotiated a bid and agreed on a price. I let them know that I would be flying in to pick up the car and offered to pay in full in advance of the flight. They told me that all they needed was a 1k deposit and that the car was considered mine. We signed a contract and I paid the deposit and then I booked the flight. For three days from then, when I showed up at the airport, the dealership was supposed to pick me up. This had been arranged in advance. A quick phone call later and I grabbed an Uber to take me the 20 miles to the dealership with the promise of them covering that cost. No big deal either way. When I showed up at the dealership, the salesman I had been speaking with asked me if I wanted to walk the lot with him to look at a few cars. Yes, cars. Plural. Questioning what he meant by that, we walked into the lot to see these cars that he was talking about. When I point blank asked to see the car that I was buying, the one listed in the signed contract with a deposit on it, I was told it was no longer available. The salesman offered to show me similar cars, which would have been fine were we able to come to similar terms on pricing, but all of these cars were outrageously priced. Think 2k over MSRP instead of 5k under MSRP. Fast forward 2-3 to three hours. I am now convinced this dealership never had this specific car on the lot and that this was 100% a bait and switch gone wrong. The dealership was unwilling to sell me a similar vehicle at a similar price to our negotiated one. We were over 5k apart and were unwilling to pay the flight costs for this bait and switch scenario. A heated discussion ensued between myself and the GM where he told me to go ahead and leave a bad review but that I wasn't getting any free money from him. I took an Uber to a nearby hotel and booked a flight back home for the next day. Total cost? Around $750. This dealership had an average Google rating of right around 4.5 stars and around 400 total reviews. Pretty solid for a dealership. That night, while I was sitting in the hotel room, I had some time to burn. I spent a couple of hours creating new email accounts just so that I could leave multiple reviews for this dealership. All said and done, I had left around 21 star reviews over the course of that night and then sort of stopped caring about the reviews. At this point, my focus shifted to recovering my lost travel expenses. A few days after getting back, I sent the dealership a demand letter for $750, which they promptly ignored. Since we had done the original contract with the deposit in both states, I was allowed to file a small claim suit in my state, which I did. The dealership never showed up to court and I received a default judgment for $750. I did collect that by the way. It took a few certified letters, a few phone calls and about a year, but I did get a check for $750. As you can imagine, I was still not a happy camper. What they had done was wrong on so many levels. All of my friends knew the story of how I was paid and switched and the fact that I flew to the dealership on a one-way ticket only made it that much worse. They had all left a bad review or two, but nothing more than a normal mad customer. I don't know how it started or how it ended up lasting as long as it has, but at some point I had some time on my hands and left a bad review for this dealership. Just one, not two, not three, one. In doing so, I noticed that all of the reviews I had left right after leaving the dealership were gone, probably taken down for being fake or because I had left so many at the same time and the dealership reported them. 
I wanted to make sure this dealership wouldn't do this to someone else. So the next day, I checked to make sure that one bad review I had just left was still there. It was. And since I was thinking about it, I went ahead and created another account and left another one star review. Fast forward two to three years. It has now become a habit. Every time I have a few minutes to spare, I create a new account and leave a one star review for this dealership. The current rating? 1.9 stars with nearly 3.5k total reviews. I am personally responsible for at least half of those reviews. When you open the dealer's website, one of the large banners that flashes across the screen advertises $50 for a 5 star review. Something about showing the review to your salesman to get a $50 Visa gift card. It has been this way since about a year after the spade and switch occurred. Right around the time the one star reviews began to accumulate. Assuming I am responsible for half of the reviews and the fact that the dealership only has 3.5k total reviews, they have paid $50 per review for at least a thousand reviews. Likely more than that. Meaning they have implemented a policy to pay for reviews, have spent 50k doing so and have still seen their average rating drop consistently since telling me to go ahead and leave a bad review. Thanks for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please don't forget to leave a like, comment and subscribe. And if you have time, watch another one of my videos. And now I hope you have a great day. See you soon. Bye bye.